If you've listened to Brewlosophy at all, you know how much we love Imperial Yeast. The company was founded on the ideal that if you're going to do something, do it right. From their Imperial Pitch Right pouches, packing a whopping 200 billion cells of healthy and viable yeast in each pouch, to their commitment to commercial customers guaranteeing 10 of their most popular strains are in stock for orders up to 20 liters or the shipping is free, Imperial Yeast does it right. No more worrying about whether you need to make a starter or propagate your yeast prior to pitching. Imperial Yeast makes it easy for the home brewer and commercial brewer to obtain direct pitches at proper rates when you need it. To place a commercial order or to get more information about everything that Imperial Yeast has to offer, head on over to imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. The goal of most new advanced hop products is to get maximum hoppy aroma into beer while reducing the downsides of working with T90 pellets, especially those associated with high hop loads like reduced yield, dealing with the biomass of spent hops, and even some flavor and aroma stripping from such high amounts of hops being added to the fermenter. I'm your host, Cade Job, and today in the lab I'm speaking with Jake Kirkendall about a new advanced hop product from Calsec called Lupulock and how you can use it and other advanced hop products to reduce dry hop loads in beer. Lupulock is a novel product because it's dry and in solid form. It's not a liquid, but it contains fractionated hop oils in a crystalline structure. Think of it kind of looking like salt granules. And this powder or um, salt granule allows for easy storage and use during brewing, but it also potentially allows for the reduction of T90 pellets and whole cone hop usage. Jake and the team at Calsec did a couple of experiments looking at ways that you might be able to reduce the dry hop load in your beer by using advanced hop products like Lupilock and others. And so today, we'll spend the first half of the show talking about Lupilock, how they encapsulate all that wonderful hop oil in a dry substance, and then spend the second half of the show looking at various dry hop reduction methods to help you maximize the hoppy aroma in your beer without the downsides of dry hopping. If you haven't yet signed up to become a patron, please consider doing so. By becoming a patron of Brewlosophy, you get awesome rewards like access to the Brewlosophy contributor recipes that we've never published, new discounts each month to YakimaValleyHops.com, and for $3 a month, access to a monthly live Q&A session with a special guest from the brewing industry. Becoming a patron is easy. Once you've contributed at the $3 level or higher, you get access to the private Patreon Facebook page where all of the previous Q&A sessions are available to watch, so guests like Vinny Chalur John Palmer, the brewlosopher himself, Marshall Schott, and the next guest is Andrew Burns of Dakota County Technical College. You remember him uh, from a prior episode where we talked about getting a brewing education. Andrew worked as a brewer and as a brewery team manager responsible for hiring and managing other brewers, so he's got a perspective that you'll want to listen to if you're thinking about entering the brewing industry. All the information that you need to get access to this awesome resource is available at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, so go check it out. Thank you to everyone that's left a rating or review of the show. We're over 100 ratings on Apple Podcasts, which is awesome. So if you haven't yet left a rating or review on your podcast service of choice, I'd really appreciate it. Take a second. Let me know what you think of the show so that others like you can also find us. Feedback this week is from listener Philip. He says, hi, Cade. I'm reaching out to you because if I'm not mistaken, I haven't seen an episode about calm yeast so far. And by the way, big fan of the show, although it's always hard work getting everything the first time. I know, Philip, that's a that's one of the challenges, but it is why we have the Applying the Sciences episodes. Maybe it isn't such a big deal in the U.S. as you guys have better sources in regards to beer microbiology, but one of my listeners reached out to me and asked whether I could explain what calm yeast is and what could be done about it. Uh, just for backstory, so Philip has a German podcast, so any German listeners out there, you should definitely check out Philip and his podcast. Um, But he says, uh, especially in regards to do I have to dump the batch? That's the main question that his listeners have about calm yeast. Philip continues, I'm not an active scientist per se. I decided against a career in academia after my PhD, but I try to keep up with questions like this that I enjoy tremendously. Anyway, I would love to see a show on this topic. Kind regards, Philip. Hey, Philip, that's a really cool show idea. I actually had to look it up. I didn't know what calm yeast was. Um, This is the first time I had heard the term, but I guess it's essentially yeast that is present in your beer that's maybe consuming sugars, but not necessarily fermenting, or at least it's not the main Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, that you want to do, uh, that you want 
you know, for your beer. It could actually cause mold or other things like that that might make you think you want to dump a batch. Like, if you've ever seen those white spots on top of beer in your fermenter, they look like little clouds um, of white spot. Uh, that might be calm yeast. Uh, that might be something that you need to dump. It might be an infection, but it might also be harmless. Uh, so this is a cool show idea, Philip. And uh, Philip actually uh, volunteered to come on and talk about it. So we're going to have an upcoming episode on that. Thanks for sharing, Philip. Hopefully, um, you and I can get together soon to do this episode. After the break, I'll be back with Jake Kirkendall talking about Lupulock and dry hop reduction methods. The dry yeast revolution is here and Cellar Science is leading the charge. Cellar Science has expanded the world of dry yeast far beyond the drab landscape of yesteryear. With over 20 strains of beer and wine yeast now available, you can brew any style. Not to mention that their unique growth and harvesting process greatly increases lipid levels in yeast cell walls, removing the need to aerate your wort on the first pitch and allowing you to directly pitch without rehydration. Couple that with the other advantages of dry yeast, such as higher cell count and viability, and you can clearly see why commercial breweries across the U.S. are using dry yeast and choosing cellar science. There are a range of products that can be used to maximize hoppy aroma and flavor in beer. And I recently discussed a new water-based hop extract from John I. Haas called Hopkick, but there are other products out there like Calcix Lupulock. Joining me today in the lab to discuss Lupulock and other advanced hop products and also how to reduce dry hop is Jake Kirkendall. Jake, welcome back to the Brew Lab. Hey, thanks for having me back, Cade. Oh, man, I can't believe it's been three years um, since you were last on the podcast. Jake, of course, was here last on episode eight, where we talked about the freshening power of Centennial Hops, or what most people refer to as hop creep. And uh, one of the cool benefits or you know, maybe disadvantages of these new hop products is that there is no vegetative hop material that makes it into the beer and thus no creeps. Jake, will this uh, does Lup- Lupulock do the same thing? Is there no creep? Are you still studying hop creep or is that a thing of the past? So I'm not looking at hop creep currently just because most of the products I work with are pellets. Um, But I think Lupulock can be a product that, you know, you could consider to help manage it. Um, I I really think products like Lupulock work best in conjunction with a portion of traditional pellets. Um, But I think, you know, having something where you're reducing your pellet load, you're reducing your hop creep um, could be really beneficial. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, again, I think it's one of the big benefits. You may be sort of an under um, understated benefit of these products because it doesn't come with all that vegetative matter. And we'll get into a little bit more um, in a few minutes exactly what Lupulock is and how that uh, uh, product works. Um, but uh, first, I, it's since it's been three years, we should catch up. I mean, again, um, I, you are a hop scientist at CalSec. And since it's been a while, I wanted to ask, like, one, um, tell us again about your story about how you got into studying hops and then also what have you been up to since we last talked yeah so i had gotten into the the field through uh uh, i had graduated with a degree in chemistry from western michigan university um and at the same time there was a a brewing program that was just starting headed by uh former coors brewmaster mike babb um and so i had kind of done those things in conjunction uh and then Right after I graduated from college, I spent time working at Bell's, and that's where I had done the um, freshening power of Centennial Hops work. Uh, After that, I spent a little bit of time teaching brewing, uh, spent a a stint up in northern Michigan at Shorts Brewing Company in their quality department, and then was recruited to come back to CalSec to really help develop their hop oil program and um, work on the application side in that. Uh, And I would say since the last time we talked, it's it's been really interesting and there's been a lot of changes. Um, I know we were talking pre-show about you know just the different types of things that that I work on. And right now, I would say about 60% of what I work on is non-alcoholic beer and the application of of hop oils and bitterness and uh, flavors for non-alcoholic beer improvement. Um, so that's been a, a really big chunk of what I've been doing, um, as well as developing new hop products. And uh, Loopy Lock was kind of one of the the babies of mine. I, I kind of took that over. We had started that project back in 2013, I think. Um, and so it had been in the pipeline for a long time, but I had kind of picked it up and championed it and brought brought it to the market. So 
Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, non-alcoholic beer is certainly um, increasing uh, in, uh, especially, you know, as I mean, I don't know if you saw earlier this week, but there was um, indications that that some of the uh, recommendations from the U.S. federal government about how much alcohol to drink may be changing um, soon. So, yeah, this is something that uh, brewers are definitely going to be dealing with as we get into the future. And and um, I'm guessing, you know, products like Loopy Lock can be used in um, non-alcoholic beers and hop waters and those other, um, you know, maybe alcohol free beverages? Yeah, we've designed them all to be, you know, really beverage friendly. Um, so, you know, they're not going to have a, a significant increase in turbidity. Um, they're going to preserve the flavor really well. Uh, and I, I've used them everywhere from, you know, traditionally beer, but a lot in hop waters, some NA beers. I know we've played around with kombucha a little bit. Um, that That tends to be a little bit harder just from the fact of a lot of the kombucha producers are really looking at organic. Um, and we, we can't have our product fall under that organic label. Um, but in terms of, you know, if you're looking at the, the USDA where you can have, I think it's 5% that's non-organic, we can definitely fall under there a lot easier than things like pellets. So, oh, okay. Well, interesting. So I want to talk more about that um, when we get into Loop Your Lock. And I guess, you know, we've done a few episodes, uh, or at least I've done a few episodes of the podcast on advanced hop products. So I don't think we need to go back into the generalities of how those are used and all that stuff. I think we can just jump straight in um, to Loop Your Lock. So tell me about Loop Your Lock and um, uh, potentially what makes it different from other advanced hop products. So Loop Your Lock, really our, our focus with this was trying to uh, create a, a better carrier for um, hop oil products. So a lot of advanced top products are going to be delivered in uh, propylene glycol or ethanol, um, but those carriers definitely have some downsides. Um, those products generally need to be kept in refrigeration conditions. Um, you know, they've got a limited shelf life of usually one to two years on them. Um, with propylene glycol, especially in Europe, you've got to make sure you're falling under the, the limits that they have to stay under for legal reasons. Um, and then with ethanol, you've got to worry about flammability. So we really wanted to look at, you know, how do we create a, a, a carrier that is going to be more user friendly? It's going to be more concentrated, more stable. And that was kind of where Loopy Lock had come from. I see. That makes sense. So, you know, you're talking about propylene glycols and, and, and alcohol. Is that like the, are, is that, are those the carriers for like CO2 hop extracts or is that something totally different, different process? No. So this is kind of a different process. Um, and I think this is a, you know, one of the, the areas that CalSec kind of differentiates a little bit. Um, in we actually don't do CO2 extraction um, in our facilities. So we work with uh, different hop companies that do CO2 extraction and get the, the CO2 extract told. Um, what our big value add is in taking that CO2 extract and splitting it up. Um, so originally that had come from uh, Calsec had developed uh, Tetra Hop for Miller Brewing Company back in the late 70s for use in light stable beers. So at that time it would have been Miller High Life and Miller Genuine Draft. Um, and that kind of built the hops program here at CalSec. But our, our real focus has been separating out the hop acids and turning those into different advanced hop acid products. So things like hexa, tetra, rho, iso. Um, and then the oils are all separated out um, using vacuum distillation and fractionated. Um, and then we're able to blend those fractions back. Um, so we need something that'll help solubilize the oil better in the beer. Um, it, most of these products are going to be added uh, at the, the late stages of fermentation or in the bright tank. Um, so, you know, ethanol and PG have been really good uh, carriers for doing that. But again, they've got a lot of downsides and there's some solubility limits there with the hop oil. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so that makes sense then. So these products that you're doing or what you're doing at, at, at CalSec is like taking the, the CO2 extracts a, a step further and actually fractionating them out into the different um, aroma com compounds that you want to uh, have um, in your product and then, um, I guess, blending those back together. Yeah, and it, it really allows us to kind of, you know, break the symmetry anytime you're using hops. You know, if you're adding hops for aroma, you're going to add some form of bitterness and the same way with if you're adding bitterness, there's some aroma that's going to come along where with these advanced hop products, we can add those things independently. So we can make a low bitterness, high aroma beer or the other way around um, and really have kind of the ultimate flexibility there. 
Nice. Okay. So compositionally then what is loopy lock? Um, so, you know, if you've got, if I'm, I mean, I guess it's fractionated oils, but like, what is it? I mean, it's not just a, a vial of oil, right? No. So loopy lock, um, it's actually using a technology from a partner of ours. Uh, so we partnered with Ferminich, um, to use their Durarome technology. So what loopy lock actually is compositionally is about 10% hop oil. Um, and then it is, uh, encapsulated in a maltodextrin matrix. Um, and we're using sunflower less than is kind of our emulsifier there to, to readily emulsify it, but it's uh, through a melt extrusion process. So really our goal is that we want to be able to capture, you know, small, small droplets encased in this maltodextrin matrix so that we have stability and um, we're not getting any sort of kind of oxygen ingress or any of that oil that would leak out of these materials. But if you look at loopy lock itself, it almost looks like kind of a, a coarse sea salt is how I uh -huh. describe it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's like actually a solid, it's like a coarse sea salt or like a uh, powder is not necessarily the right word, but sort of that, that same, you know, um, texture, right? Like salt. Yep. It's solid. Yep. And, and so those, those aroma compounds then that you fractionated out, uh, that was a question I was going to ask. So, you know, I mean, obviously hop compounds and, and aromatics are volatile. Like you said, they're susceptible to oxygen and those things, which means they easily evaporate, evaporate. And of course, that means we can smell them, which is the, the, the thing that we like. But I was going to ask, like, how did you bind up those aromatics in that solid medium? And it sounds like you're using this maltodextrin matrix um, to bind those uh, aroma compounds so that they're there, or at least the ones that you want are there and present. Um, and then you can use that like a, a, a brewing salt or something by adding it to beer. Yeah, so it's it's easily, you know, we add it at the end of fermentation in the bright tank. Um Either, you know, when I do demos with the product, I'll add it to a, uh, usually we use sparkling water just to demonstrate it. Um, and we're adding it to cold carbonated water, um, just a small, small amount and, you know, move it back and forth a little bit and it's dissolved. The, the aroma is almost instantaneous. Yeah. So then from a, like a, how it's made perspective then, so these, these, um, uh, this loopy lock product. Well, I, I'm not going to say it. Well, I'll just ask you. So like from a how it's made, like what are the steps to getting to from hops to loopy lock? Yeah. So the, the steps really are going to be starting with CO2 extract, um, partitioning away the acids, doing the vacuum distillation and that fractionation. Um, and then there's a lot of work done on the blending side to hit either target flavor profiles or to create consistent raw materials for those flavor profiles. Um, I would say one of the, the kind of interesting things that, you know, differentiates us as well is that um, as of right now, we're not having any sort of varietal specific on any of these products. Um, we're using that distillation technology to uh, create these different profiles um, because a lot of times that the hop oil is going to be different between varieties in terms of ratios, not in terms of necessarily what's there. Um, so we're going in and we're using the distillation technology to manipulate those ratios to create different flavor profiles. Oh, that's interesting. And that, that sort of raises a question. So on my last episode, I was talking with Philip Weichstock and Brian Gibson about their um, gas hopper um, technology. And they mentioned that hop aroma or, you know, more specifically, those compounds that make up hop aroma and all their interactions make hop aroma kind of a black box as like kind of sort of we know how it works when we do this or that, but we don't know why. And I guess that's sort of an answer to um, how this product works is, yeah, but they all have the same aroma compounds. It's just how we blend those and the proportions that we blend those. So if you're able to fractionate those, um, you're able to pick the ones that you think are important and then blend those together to make a product that is um, the what you're looking for in terms of aroma. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, we've used our, our analytical department and our sensory department here to really go after some of those aromas. Um, and you know, we, we've always kind of called it the, the analytically verified and sense or analytically driven sensory verified approach. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> and so, you know, we're really using the strength of, um, you know, a lot of statistics, a lot of, uh, GCMS work. Um, we've used it, even recently added, uh, GC olfactometry to our portfolio of things that we're using to kind of, you know, really get at the core of. 
um, these hop oils. And one of the other things that I would say is really interesting about that as well is we can work on trying to match different varieties of hops, but we can also kind of go beyond, you know, what's available. So if we want to create a, a whole new flavor profile, um, we can be driven by the oils that we have instead of, you know, driven by years long breeding processes for hops. Totally. Yeah, exactly. And and you're sort of um, I'm not going to say limited by trying to match a hop profile, but you are sort of but you're sort of liberated in that you're not trying to match a hop, hop profile. You're trying to to get to the hot flavor that you want in the beer. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's always the tough thing is with customers. A lot of times we get asked, you know, hey, we're looking to match the flavor of Citra in beer. And that generates a lot of questions on, all right, where are you adding your Citra? How much contact time? What type of yeast? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, we find it's a lot easier to drive after the flavor um, and drive after things that we like that are, you know, clean and true to type rather than going after, you know, recreating someone's process that dry hopping's pretty inefficient. Um, and, you know, having the the capabilities to be able to, even if it's just partial hop replacement, um, use something that's going to be more consistent, it's going to be kind of agnostic of process and a lot easier to use is something that a lot of people have found really valuable. Yeah. And, you know, the, I mean, even just from a process perspective, that's true, but also from um, an aroma perspective, what kind of citra are you talking about? Right. Because citra itself, even just smelling the hop grinds, some of them are super lemony and citrusy. Some of them are like thiol driven and some of them are onion, garlic and dank um, or resinous. Right. That's a, those are some things that brewers really like. Well, and even year to year, you know, that's one of the the things I always talk about with advanced hop products is there's a, a lot of work that you know, not only ourselves, but the other companies that are in this space do to make sure these products are consistent. And so, you know, if you are doing things like replacements, your kind of year to year variation and amplitude of, you know, that quality, all of a sudden it's getting smaller because you've got a product that's got a very consistent aroma profile. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Yeah. Right. Cause you're not having to deal with those variations, especially as a brewer. And especially as you get larger and larger as a brewer, those variations, when you're trying to match brand profiles, um, those can be tough, um, and, and can, uh, can cause issues or even, you know, some of the research that we've seen into smoke. Um, that's one of the things that I'll be looking at in the future. And a lot of people are looking into it right now as they get another hop lot that was grown out in the field and got smoke exposed. And then suddenly they can't use that lot, um, anymore. Whereas, um, you know, these products might be able to, uh, you know, fractionate or differentiate those out might, um, be able, I might ask you a question about that a little later, but before that, I, you, you've, um, said a, a couple of times, uh, some things that sound a lot like benefits of using a product like Lukey Lock or other advanced hop product. You said consistency. You've also talked about, uh, you know, being able to, uh, pre you know, predict the flavor or aroma or, or hit a target aroma. Um, and you mentioned maybe not having to store Lukey Lock cold. What are some of the other benefits? benefits of using a product like like loopy lock i think one of the the big products or the big uh, advantages that we talk about is just that consistency um but i think there's a, a big focus for us on you know the sustainability of a, a product like this as well um because you're you're shipping such small amounts because it's so concentrated um you know you're able to have a uh, decrease if we're talking compared to hops you know we're talking a hundred times or more less material. Um, when we when we look at you know replacement rates and that, we're talking about the the application usage of this is on the scale of like grams per hectoliter. So you know three <laughs> okay. or four grams per hectoliter compared with you know seven hundred or plus grams per hectoliter. That's a that's a huge difference in you know footprint um, and then. The other big thing I think is when you look at pellets, pellets, as much as they do a great things for an IPA, um, they're also inherently wasteful. Um, what you actually get partitioning hop oil into the beer, um, some components will be higher than others. So, you know, let's take a look at something like linalool. You know, you might get 20, maybe 30% of your linalool out of your hop if you're lucky, but the rest of that 70% is going you know, right down the drain or right to uh, some kind of disposal. Um, and, you know, it's various components are worse. Linalool is probably one of the better extracted components. 
you're looking at, you know, sesquiterpenes, um, myrcene, you know, some of these esters, they're not really well absorbed into the beer. And that's why we've got to add so much in terms of hops. Um, and I would say the last kind of part of that, that equation with pellets as well is pellets soak up about 10 times their own weight in beer. And that's a lot, a lot of lost beer. So, you know, if we can really work on how do we make the most of the oil in the hops um, and how do we save as much beer as possible? I think Lupulock is something that solves those problems really well. Yeah, those are those are great, uh, you know, great benefits and great way, articulation of those benefits. And I think even, you know, from a commercial scale, certainly like, you know, saving, um, you know, batches or saving barrels of beer on each batch is going to be a, a huge benefit from a commercial perspective. But also even in the homebrew scale, we had a question last week on that episode or a couple of weeks ago on an episode where um, um, a person wrote in and said, hey, I'm getting hot products, hops stuck in my dip tube of my kegs right? okay. <laughs> yeah. and it's like oh okay well this would be a really easy way to fix that uh that issue but um i wanted to ask too so um this the sustainability piece of this is is big the footprint um you know of of storage and that sort of stuff and one of the things that i've learned as, over doing this podcast is one of the big energy costs of breweries is cold storage and that includes cold storage of their raw ingredients like hops um which need to be kept you know frozen or cold to avoid oxygen exposure. And so does, uh, you know, uh, uh, does a product like Loopy Lock offer advantages there? Can you store it room temperature or does it also have to be stored cold? Yeah. So it's designed to be stored room temperature. Um, really the biggest thing is avoiding moisture because that moisture will rupture the encapsulation. So keeping it in a, a dry place. Um, but room temperature storage is totally fine. That's how we've intended the product. Uh, and it's got about a three-year shelf life from time of production um, on this material at room temperature. I know currently we're looking at extending that out further. Um, you know, it's there's some verification that needs to be done on the sensory side. I can say from an anecdotal uh, kind of perspective, I have some of the original samples we ran back in 2013, uh, <laughs> and they still smell phenomenal. It's very wild to me that they're That's that That's amazing. Stable. 11 so. years eleven years later. I mean, I'm certainly uh, certain if you went into um, some brewery's freezer and picked some hops that were 11 years old, they probably wouldn't. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not great. Smell that good. Um, that's amazing. And then, okay, so then another thing, too, that we talk about, um, one of the challenges or difficulties with, like, CO2 extracts or something is um, it, it can be a little bit hard to get those into solution, right? Because of the nature of the extraction process, the solubility is not all that great. What's, um, you know, I would think something that's like salt, um, you know, do you have um, solubility challenges there? Does it dissolve easily and readily into uh, beer? So it, it dissolves very easily and readily into cold carbonated uh, liquids, whether it be water or beer. Um, usually when we've kind of developed a couple of different ways to dose it just based on you know, what, what our customers are, are able to do. Um, I know the primary way that we've used it is just addition to a bright tank and transfer on top of it. Um, you know, adding it into a turbulent beer flow, I think is kind of the best way to, to get it dissolved well and evenly mixed. Um, but we've also done some work where we've taken, uh, you know, de-aerated sterile water um, and mixed lupulock at 50 to one water to lupulock. Um, and then added that to the beer to, to dissolve it well. Uh, so that that's more used for breweries that are used to dosing things in line um, that you can, you know, hook up a pump and kind of have it evenly distributed as you do a transfer. Um, but yeah, they're very, very easy to use. Um, you know, if, if you can add salt into a pot of water, that's as easy as, as it is. So. Yeah, exactly. I like the idea of even going into the bright tank or for a home brewer going straight into the keg. Yeah. Or if you have the ability to inject it in line or even make a solution beforehand and then inject that. Um, yeah, that seems like, that seems really cool and, and really easy to use. So another benefit that Shay Maloney and uh, Jeff Daly mentioned about Hopkick um, is that customers are increasingly interested in clean label uh, products. And and so um, since this is, you know, uh, in, encapsulated and using some proprietary technology for the encapsulation, the maltodextrin matrix is it still clean label um in terms of um, hop additions yeah so it's it's still going to be considered hops um we've actually split our line into uh so calsec has a line of 100 percent hop drive products um so two of the products that we've got for the loopy lock line are 100 percent hops in the u.s they would just be labeled as hops um for beer 
Uh, in other beverages, it would generally be labeled hop extract. Um, and then we also have two products that are going to be hops with other natural flavors. So there are certain components that are a little harder to get at using the extraction processes, things like polyfunctional thiols, um, to where until you know better technology has been made to liberate and stabilize and blend those, um, we're sourcing those from other natural flavors. Um, so for example, we've got a product called West Coast Hop Shine um, that we've got a, a little bit of some of those passion fruit thiols added to the product so that we're we're hitting that flavor profile uh, despite, you know, how hard it is to get at some of those aromas. You know, that was one of the questions I was going to ask, too. I mean, people talk a lot about the gestalt of using, you know, hops or or pellets. You know, I mean, I think about, of course, you know, Sierra Nevada being used with whole cone hops for years and years and years. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if it's still made with whole cone hops, but, you know, that was that was a, 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 a big deal for them. It's like, no, the whole cones add something different than the pellets. And there's this sort of gestalt from having even hop vegetative material. Do you still find that with uh, using products like Lupulox or are there things missing? Do you have to supplement in areas? So I, I always recommend, especially, you know, Lupulox intended for dry hopping. Um, for those kind of purposes, I always recommend using it in conjunction with pellets. Uh, and the big reason for that is that, you know, you're going to get some of the, the non-volatile things that aren't going to be extracted and distilled off. So I know for me, the biggest thing has been uh, a lot of the polyphenols um, that help give some of the mouthfeel. A product like Lupulox only going to be adding volatiles. So, you know, a small amount of pellets to be able to add some of that or even go after some of the, the polyfunctional thiols that are naturally in the hops and extract some of that. Um, but I, I view Lupulock and, you know, other advanced hop products that are kind of like it as a way to, you know, supplement and increase your efficiency um, rather than completely replace the hops. There is still some magic there that you know, if, if anyone says that they've solved liquid dry hopping, I would tend to not believe them. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a tough challenge. We're all going after it. Uh, but until we get there, you know, it's it's a product to be used in conjunction to offer the efficiency of, you know, our extraction. Brewing's inherently an extraction process. We're just doing it more efficiently. But there's things that we don't know how to quite do yet. So, you know, I think using them together is a, a big benefit and usually how I recommend using the product. Yeah, yeah. And I like this approach too. like nothing in brewing is binary, at least as far as I can tell, right? Nothing exists in a vacuum or, or you know, you just add this one magic product and suddenly, boom, you have great tasting beer, <laughs> you know. So I love that approach, like right? still using pellets and, and uh, uh, you know, you mentioned specifically the non-volatiles that are important. And so you, you, the, the fractionation that you talked about originally in making Lupulox sounds like you still retain those non-volatiles, not in Lupulox itself, but you still have those non-volatiles that you can do other other things with so yeah that's that's kind of the hard thing is the non-volatiles i think we're looking at going after are all kind of left in spent hops um so you know i think there'd be some some opportunity for folks to look at you know using spent hops in conjunction with advanced top products um and you know can you get those non-volatiles out or even going after some of that in spent um but as as far as i i know you know, there's not a whole lot of work that's been done on trying to create, you know, just a polyphenol hop fraction for, you know, adding those components for dry hopping. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, uh, you know, and uh, one last question sort of about Lupulock. You mentioned earlier the the sustainability piece of this and reduced, you know, uh, 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 cold uh, temperature requirements and also the smaller size, um, meaning that you don't have to ship around huge volumes of pellets. You don't have loss um, um, of beer. That to me seems like a really important piece, especially for brewers that are trying to tell a sustainability story. And as we look at, you know, hops and the challenges that growers are going to face with climate change, it seems like these advanced hot products really are playing a key role in how the industry meets these challenges from sustainability. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other thing is just that, that consistency and, you know, from, from having worked in, in breweries where, you know, you may have a, a batch of beer that has, you know, you switch to a different lot of pellets um, and, and you might have some of that and all of a sudden you've got, you know, some complex blending. Um, you might have something that, you know, switch to a pellet that has way more hop creep. So, you know, having something like this that's going to be consistent always is going to help with kind of mitigating some of those quality challenges that you get from using, you know, agricultural products that have a lot of, a lot of variety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, things change year to year and, and all that. I mean, um, you know, uh, I, I actually, that's a good question too. And I mean, we'll ask this last question before we take the break. I mentioned earlier smoke and I asked this of Jeff Daly um, last, uh, a couple of weeks ago on hop kick. Um, if, uh, you know, they're this, uh, if the hops are smoky, will they make it into the, to the beer um, or into the um, advanced hop product? And he said, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, indication that that might be the case. Uh, but what about something like loopy lock? and fractionation are you able to pull those out or will the smoke still make it in or do you do you know is it even something that calsex looked at yet so we we haven't looked at it necessarily um i know there's been some talk about looking at it but you know i think there's there's a lot of work that's being done right now on how to mitigate it at the field and it's always going to be easier to mitigate at the field than you know deal with a a, a product downstream that's going to become more complicated to to blend and separate out those things um i i always like to try and say you know, good material in is going to be good material out and bad material in means that there's going to be a lot of hands on, you know, kind of artisanal uh, blending of those things to make sure that you're hitting the profiles. So, you know, we haven't necessarily looked at that um, as of yet, but, you know, if it continues to be a a problem and we don't mitigate it at the the farm level, um, I could see that being something to where we would look into how do we use that fractionation to separate things out you know, does that, where does the smoke tape end up in, in your processing and all of that? Yeah. 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 I, I think that's a really good answer and hopefully it's something that we'll be able to uh, look into and see in the future. Let's uh, let's break here. And then when we come back, we're going to look at uh, how you can use advanced hop products like loopy lock um, as part of dry hop reduction methods. So we'll be right back. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. A while back, I had Chris Willig on the show talking about using CRISPR, Cas9, and other gene editing tools in hot breeding, and he shared that one of the founding influences of his research was his father-in-law asking if Chris could make a customizable hop. So, Jake, a cool benefit of advanced hop products like this that utilize fractionation is cool customizations of flavors. Can you make a custom hop flavor loopy lock? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. I think, you know, right, right now there's the, the four products that we've made are, um, you know, all customizations that we've done for actual customers, uh, and what we thought was going to be the most applicable. Um, I think one of the hard things with, you know, if we had someone approaching us, that would have to be a, a certain opportunity size because the, the minimum batch size that we can run for loopy lock is about 400 kilos. And we're, when you're using, you know, two to four grams per hectoliter, you know, it's a pretty big opportunity you need. But yeah, we definitely have the ability to, you know, make some of these custom hop blends. And it's a little easier for us to do it in kind of our traditional carriers. But um, it, we've not had anything that we'd make for a traditional carrier that hasn't worked well in Loopy Lock in that encapsulation process. So tell me then about the blends that you have um, currently available. What are those and what kind of notes and aromas do those add to the beer? So the first two products that that we have in the line are going to be our 100% hop derived. Um, my favorite of those is Hop Rub. So this is kind of a, a a full spectrum hop oil extract where we've removed some of the the bad actors, things like isovaleric acid, you know, some kind of the off flavors, 
Um, and it, it's kind of a, a fresh hop, a little piney, a little bit dank. Um, it's definitely got a, a woody character, but a little bit of floral background from a good slug of linalool that's in the product. Um, and then the other 100% hop drive product is called Hop Surge. Um, and this is just our mercine fraction that's been encapsulated. And, you know, despite mercine not having a, a huge play, there's definitely some in IPAs. Uh, I think it's a lot of the, the kind of minor components, the esters that are in this fraction that really kind of help um, in its use as kind of a, a hop kick and a, a, a boost of aroma um, that can be added to, to any type of dry hop beer. Or like a nice surge of aroma. And I like the, I like the name of that first one too, hop rub, because you said it's it sort of smells like a fresh like fresh hops. And so is that a use case for it? Is in like fresh hopped beers? It it can be. Um, you know, I don't think it's quite as dank as fresh hopped beers are, but you know, we've seen it. It offers a a good, very balanced dry hop profile. Um, you know, it's it's not varietal specific. If I were to compare it to something, it would be maybe somewhat along the lines of like a CTZ dry hop. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's easily balanced and a lot of folks that are, have used that they've used it with name brand varietals. So things like Citra or Mosaic that they can, you know, use those to really get that, that thial punch and some of that citrus character, but have a, a nice consistent base hop aroma. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Nice. Okay. So that's Hop Surge and Hop Rub, the two um, 100% hop uh, derived products. And then um, the other two that you've got, West Coast Hop Shine and Hop Bright. Yeah. So West Coast Hop Shine is our uh, award-winning hop oil um, that it is a, a blend of a hop oil profile with a little bit of natural flavor to kind of punch up the tropical aroma. Um, it's got a very kind of passion fruit, tropical citrus uh, you know, West Coast, old school dry hop character to it. Um, and we've we've had a lot of work with that that we've done in beers, uh, in seltzers, but it's a, a very well-beloved product in the product line and probably one of our best sellers um, for that uh, hop plus natural flavor character. And then the second one is called Hop Bright. Um, and this was actually designed after, uh, you know, very citrusy forward hops. Um, and we really worked on, this was a, a single hop beer that we did using one of the, the citrusy focused hops where we actually went out and sourced the, the target files in the target concentrations that we'd find them in the beer so that we get a, you know, finished fermented hop oil character that performs on that, you know, highly desirable citrus character. Oh, wow. Interesting. So it sounds like each of these hop products is sort of designed. You mentioned earlier to, that, that it's nice to use them with pellets, and it seems like each of these ones is developed to fit nicely into your current brewing practices. You know, it's adding like an additional uh, flavor component to it, maybe adding a little bit of, you know, maybe adding some tropical citrus, passion fruit, those areas, or, you know, like you said, the more piney, floral, and slightly dank from hop rub, you know, or the myrcene even from hop surge, right? Some more green and herbal characteristics. So it seems like it's um it's really a, a, like it's a good way or at least these current blends are a good way to nuance and modify um or get more out of uh hop aroma um in in a beer without adding any more hops or without having to change your even current process you can just add this product and and uh, it, it goes right in yeah absolutely and i think also you know when designing new products having things like this to design it to be a more sustainable beer uh, or even just add complexity in the hop character. Um, that's that's where we, I feel like, have used it the most is, you know, in trying to design a more sustainable beer for, from the start rather than replace it in, in kind of current production. Um, that's, that's one of the things I'll, I'll talk with a lot of craft brewers is, you know, I'm, I'm not here to, to say, yeah, you got to put this in your flagship IPA. But I'm here to give you tools that when you're designing beers, you're designing beers for the future that are more sustainable. They're going to be more consistent um, and they're going to offer you a lot of benefits, even in the cost areas. Yeah. And complexity, too. That's a key. Right. Adding a beer that's complex. Right. You're not just one note. It's not just this or that. It's not monotonal. It's complex. It's got a lot of different hop aroma and flavor. And again, sustainable and easy to use, which is great, too, because as we all know, dry hopping um, is it serves a function, but it's hard. <laughs> you, you know, you've got to you got to pay attention to oxygen ingress. You got to do something with the spent hops and all those other complications that come with it. Hop creep, as you and I are, are, are uh, fully aware of. Um, and so 
dry hopping does create some challenges, and you guys just recently presented some research at the European Brewing Congress, um, which is where you and I uh, uh, talked uh, about using hop extracts and things like uh, hop extracts and advanced hop products, things like Lupulox, um, Lupulock, there we go, you can use my words, um, uh, to uh, reduce uh, or potentially, um, you know, yeah, to potentially reduce the amount of dry hops. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that research? Yeah, so we had we had kind of looked at, you know, how do we best explain how to use a product like this that, you know, kind of almost seems a little foreign to brewers. Um, and so we had come up with kind of two methods that we wanted to really use to to demonstrate the product and show the advantages. So the first was just looking at a, a dry hop reduction method. And so we had done this work in conjunction with Kalamazoo Valley Community College's brewing program. Um, and we brewed a, a mother batch of beer, a mother IPA recipe, and we had about five days of fermentation. And then we split that recipe into four smaller fermenters. Um, and each of these fermenters, we had one that got equivalent of about two pounds per barrel of dry hop, one pound per barrel, half pound, and no dry hop. And then our goal was is to, once we get those finished beers, do some evaluation and add lupuloc and possibly other hop products like hop acids and, and such to be able to match the aroma um, and show that, you know, you can do this dry hop reduction and here's what the actual costs look like and here's what the sensory impacts are. So were you actually able to match the aroma? Yeah, so we had a really good result, I think, um, with at least the the 50 and 75% reduction, so the one pound per barrel and the half pound. Um, we had brought these to our sensory panel with a, a formulation that in, included lupuloc and some hop acids, and we had done a, a degree of difference test. So we're looking at a, a scale of zero to five, uh, or a one, a one to five scale, um, and how different is this from the control? Uh, all of this was blinded. Um, and while we did find significant differences between them, um, the, uh, the DOD scores were all going to be below two, um, which means that despite those statistically significant differences, there's no practical difference between them. So, you know, being below two is they wouldn't be able to identify that there was a difference if they didn't have a control right in front of them. And we had no consistency in terms of it wasn't, you know, all of the panelists that came out and said, yep, this is what's different. It was, there's maybe something different, but you're kind of between that limit of detection and limit of quantitation um, to where, you know, the general customer, I don't think would, would notice the difference, you know, because this is a train panel, they're kind of zoning in on there's something there, but they even couldn't tell quite what it was. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing, right? To think on a scale of one to five, these beers that were still had some dry hop in them, um, you know, but advanced product used to supplement the the part that was removed were, like you said, they were mostly the same. On a scale of one to five, the differences were less than two, right? And which, like you said, that's really no practical difference, um, even though, sh of course, there may be statistical differences. One of them might be closer to one, you know, the others might be, or another one might be closer to two for a statistic standpoint. But still, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing to see that you were able to to do that. And so again, the 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 ones that um, you w were on the degree of different scale uh, less than two were the ones that did have a small amount of dry hop added. So like you said, twenty five percent, fifty percent versus the full dry hop. Um, those plus the advanced hop products, those were same. But the no dry hop one with just completely advanced hop products, that one didn't seem to be the same as a fully dry hopped beer. Yeah, I, I would say we didn't even get a match that we felt comfortable sending to our panel because, you know, we could pick it out every time. Um, and that kind of goes back to why we use, you know, pellets in conjunction. Um, and there definitely was a, a difference in mouthfeel um, that we we had from those. Um, and, you know, it, it was it, it didn't feel like the complete picture. You know, it, it didn't give an authentic representation of what you want an IPA to be. And so we didn't even send that to our, our panel for testing because we didn't feel that it was up to quality there. And that's, again, you know, I think another representation of why we recommend pellets in conjunction is because until, you know, we've perfected liquid dry hop technology, 
you know, there still is a use for hops and I think they're really valuable. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and again, another piece of this too, that you meant that, um, was in your poster that I think is worth talking about for just a quick second here is there was also, you mentioned cost savings, um, and of course sustainability. We've talked about the sustainability, you know, reduced beer waste, you know, all the benefits of using a product, uh, that doesn't require cold storage and shipping and all that sort of stuff. But the cost savings was pretty cool. Yeah. So when we had done, uh, just eliminating half of that dry hop, we found about 10% cost savings um, just on that pellet reduction. And that's taken into effect, you know, the actual raw materials. So pellets versus the extracts, uh, as well as beer that would be recovered um, from making that kind of switch. It does not take into effect the, you know, the shipping cost and the carbon footprint of that, um, you know, the storage. There's lots of kind of fringe benefits that are a little bit harder um, to capture. And I know one of the things we're kind of continuing on with this research um, that we're looking at is, you know, being able to decrease the fermentation time because you get less of the hop creep. And, you know, if you look at a large practical brewery, you know, if you can cut off a day or two of fermentation time, all of a sudden, you know, that over the course of the year and you're not having to buy new tanks to keep up with capacity. So, you know, that can be a huge savings to just move liquid through a brewery faster. Sure. You know, and then the other thing that's always a big concern for brewers, like I would say one of their, the top priorities is, again, shelf stability. What does this beer look like when it gets out into the product? And so, you know, that's something that Jeff Daly has mentioned to me several times about advanced hop products, that they seem to increase shelf stability. So even there, even though I know this wasn't part of what you guys looked at in this study, it seems like that's something um, that Loopy Lock or other advanced products would also play a role with is increasing the actual shelf stability of the beer, not having all this vegetative material, not having to oxygenate your beer when you're dry hopping and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I think even, you know, in the fractionation, there's specific fractions that we leave out uh, in our processing that, you know, contribute to off flavors. So, you know, removing those from the the process entirely can, you know, easily make a, a more pleasant and a more shelf stable product. Yeah. And so the cool thing, this research, again, shows that it is possible to supplement or to to replace a portion of your dry hopping bill with advanced hop products. But there was, of course, another method that you guys also tested, and that was called zero day dry hopping. Yeah. So with the zero day, we we said, all right, well, how do we how do we impart some of these components that um, we really like from using pellets in dry hopping without ever having an actual dry hop? Um, and when we were spiraling originally on this, there was a, a brewer that we were working with that their idea was to shift the pellets into the whirlpool so that you're getting hot extraction of some of those polyphenols, some of your polyfunctional thiol precursors, um, and then to, you know, just have advanced hop products in your final beer. Um, so what we had found there was that, you know, we were able to get I would say somewhat close. Um, in this fact, we weren't trying to necessarily match the beer, but our entire goal was is to make a market acceptable IPA, to make something that's in the same flavor space. Um, you know that when you're designing a new beer, this would be a, a way to go. And I think it it really did in the end. It gave us the mouthfeel that we were looking at. Um, and really, there was only kind of one downside. Um, and we're kind of redoing some of this work for World Brewing Congress, um, but we hadn't even, you know, really thought about how much of a difference uh, before doing these that there was going to be an ISO. So when you dry hop, you're soaking up a portion of your your isomerized hop acids into the pellets, and you're imparting humulinones. And so when we had done this work, our controlled dry hop beer was about 40 ppm of ISO and about 23 ppm of humulinones where the same beer where we had just added uh, the pellets into the Whirlpool, um, we were at about 60 ppm of ISO and about 21 ppm of humulinones. So, you know, I, we're doing some work actually today. Our brewer, Dan, is um, brewing kind of the, the new batch we're looking at analyzing. And we're looking at, that's another thing that we think we'll be able to save on is decreasing your bittering because you're not losing that ISO due to the hops soaking it up. 
Yeah, exactly. The, the the material, right? Your loss of of iso alpha acids, and then you know the other things that you were talking about, like um, myrcene and some of these other uh, components that are going to get bound up in the dry hop material and drop out. Like there is a stripping um, effect that you see by adding dry hops into beer. Some things get stripped out with those spent hops. Yeah, um, but for the work that we've done now, we've got you know I think some good preliminary um, look at you know, percent volume of cold break. Um, we went from 5.1% loss on the, the control dry hop beer, um, which was at a pound per barrel dry hop to about 3% in the zero day dry hop beer. Um, so we're, we're definitely kind of saving beer there. And we were able to cut two full days off the fermentation time with this process as well. That's amazing. Yeah, for for brewers, I mean, especially commercial brewers, that's incredible. Give me two days back, and they're gonna they're gonna be able to brew entirely new batches of beer, right? That's gonna that's gonna be huge. Oh yeah. Well, and I I think you know there's I think there's still some work to be done on kind of refining this. So we're really looking at it from the hop acid side, um, and you know how do we we were about cost neutral when we did this, um, but can we reduce the the whirlpool pellets we had? We did a a pound per barrel in whirlpool versus a pound per barrel dry hop. And I think next time we're, we're going to look at, we weren't quite as happy with the, we didn't have quite as much aroma as I think we wanted in our control beer. Um, so we're going to kind of spread it out and do about a pound per ba- pound and a half per barrel in dry hop. And then only a half pound in the whirlpool and see if we can, you know, kind of cross that bigger gap, but still have all of the non-volatile components and be able to deliver on the the full sensory impact there. Yeah. Oh man, it's so amazing to see the use cases of these uh, these hot products. Well, first of all, to see the products themselves, right? Things like Loopy Lock and other products that are out there that are you know encapsulating hop aroma, so that you can add it directly to your beer without these other considerations, right? Like hop creep and dry hop and beer loss and and oxidation and uh, off flavors that you fractionated out. I mean, it's really incredible uh, to to see this, and of course to look at these new methods like reducing dry hops and then also pushing all of your dry hops over into the whirlpool um, and then using advanced uh, products uh, in the beer. I mean, it's really amazing. So, well, what is, um, can I ask, what is next then in the CalSec world of hop products? So I think the next thing that we're really excited about is we're bringing uh, kind of a first to market product that we have a kettle product that uh, is humulinos. Um, so these are the oxidized alpha acids. Um, and we think that this is going to be part of that, you know, dry hop solution and getting closer to liquid dry hopping um, because this is the bitterness of dry hopping. Um, Humulinones are about 60% as bitter as uh, isoalpha acids are, um, but they're a different quality of bitterness. They have a very smooth bitterness to them. Um, and we think that, you know, this will be something that will be able to push kind of some of that non-volatile that we're missing. Um into having a more authentic dry hop character and even for regular beer production. Um, We've done some lagers with uh, humulinones and the bitterness quality on them is phenomenal. Um, And one of the kind of interesting other things we discovered doing that work is humulinones are actually light stable. So, you know, it would be an opportunity for brewers to create a more pleasant bitterness, light stable beer um, using this new hop acid. Oh, it's fascinating. I love it. The more I talk about bitterness, the more I'm fascinated by this whole concept, right? I mean, everybody thinks isoalpha, isoalpha, isoalpha. And then, uh, you know, the research comes in about auxiliary bittering compounds like humulinones, oxidized alpha acids, and then, of course, beta acids and some other things, you know, that that make it in. Um, and I've done a couple of podcast episodes on this topic. Uh, and I think that's really cool to see a product of humulinones that's adding this quality of bitterness that people really seem to like. And so it's an advanced hop product, not just to add bitterness to beer, but to add a quality of bitterness uh, that is a, that affects your sensory perception of the beer. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, I, I've seen in the international brewing community and among, you know, kind of the, the large brewers of the world that I, I don't think you've seen as much in the, the, you know, craft brewing world is, you know, we always think about ISO, but if, if you look at up until, you know, Hemulinone's kind of being the new player, but we've had um, Tetra, Hexa, and Rho available, and they all do really interesting things. Um, you know, they can help with foam stability. Uh, I know Rho is specifically liked for 
um, you know, kind of the softness of bitterness that it's imparting. Um, Tetra is a great hop to use, especially if you want something a little more bitey. Um, I know some some large uh, American craft brewers that they'll actually use Tetra in their double IPAs just to kind of cut through a little bit of that sweetness and alcohol a little bit better and, you know, just have that little extra bite, that little extra foam retention. And so, you know, it's kind of a, I, I always talk about these products as a toolkit, you know, and, and when you're looking at designing beers, this is something that, you know, is easy to use um, and kind of gets you to, to, again, break that symmetry and break out of, you know, the restrictiveness of the pellet into, you know, different fractions of things, different bitterness characteristics. There's a, a lot, I think, this world has to offer to brewers. Totally. Different quality aspects that are certainly important. And and yeah, like you said, Tetra products being a little bit more of that biting bitterness versus humulinones that have maybe more of that, um, you know, rounded or or, or soft bitterness um, that that uh, seems to be desirable. So using a product like humulinone in conjunction with products like Lupilock or other advanced hop products, um, it seems like you can really kind of craft, craft whatever beverage or whatever flavors and aromas you want in beer. And so with that... Um, um, set up, I'll, I'll ask you this question that I always ask of guests. Um, if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, what would it be? I think what I'd want brewers to take away from this episode is really, you know, kind of what these products are um, in that they're they're hops, right? You know, they're in different formats than, than you're used to, but brewing is an extraction process. And, you know, brewers are extracting bitterness and aroma from hops. And, the, the advanced hop product makers are really working hard to do that more efficiently and put that efficiency of extraction in your hands. And I think things like Lupilock add that efficiency, they add more consistency, and they allow brewers a lot more control over their processes. Yeah, yeah, that's a key, right? Giving your brewers control over the process and also an understanding of what's going on. I think that's a cool a cool aspect of this too, right? Adding dry hops results in hop aroma, but it's it's not necessarily magic. There's some science that's going on. There's compounds that are responsible for that and things that you can remove and add that can um, tweak or a supplement or take away aromas. Um, and that's really, really cool to see scientists looking into this. Well, Jake, uh, thank you so much for joining me in the Brew Lab today. Day, and thank you for sharing all the cool things that's that calsec has been up to and with uh, respect to hops yeah thanks kate anytime i'd love to come back and uh you know you make a great podcast here and i'm, I'm just excited to to be back on after three years maybe next time we make it a little bit shorter <laughs> i think we, we've got to do that right we, let's not make it three years before the next time but very cool thank you uh jake for being here so all right I'll, uh, listeners there will be a link to the calsec website for lupulock and a link to a craft beer and brewing article back from 2022 about lupulock and next week jordan and i'll be applying the science of this episode so we'll see y'all then The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.